Oh, that's all right. I got it. Um, so she asked, she's basically feels that she's at the point where, yeah, she's still getting things from classes or books or whatever, but what she'd really like to have is people working directly with her work, critiquing her stuff, and what resources would I recommend? Um, first of all, I'm a huge supporter of writers groups. If you're not in a writers group, I always say you're not a writer, you're a typist. You must do two things to improve as a writer. You must get critiqued from other people, preferably people who don't care about you, so not your mom, not your spouse, you know, not your lover, they like you. Um, somebody who will kick you in the teeth and, and have no qualms about it. But the other thing is, and, and this always makes me frustrated when, and it just happened with a private client of mine just last week when I was talking to her about getting into a writer's group. And she's like, well, I don't want to make other writers better. And I'm like, it's, it's not, that's not what it's for. You can't become a better writer unless you're critiquing other people, period. It's just the way it works. So you must be in a writer's group. I, I run three private writer's groups out of my home. I don't read anything at them. I'm only there to critique them. And why I do it is because it makes me a better writer and I've got 50 beta readers that read my stuff and critique it. So I don't really need the writer's group for me, for my writing, I do it for, you know, for them. So you have to critique other people and you have to be critiqued to be a better writer. So that's, that's one thing. Um, of course, you can hire somebody. Um, you know, I offer that service. I don't, I'm not an editor. You would not want to pay me to edit your work. You'd end up paying me more than you'll ever make on the book. Um, but I do help people get better with their own writing. That's basically what I do with my private consulting services, where we take your writing, and then I work with you one-on-one -on -one to make you better at it so that then you can go find those same mistakes because I don't want to go through every page of your stuff and point out the exact same mistakes that you've made on 150 pages. I'd rather just teach you once and then let you go do that. Um, so it just depends on kind of where you're at and what you're doing. I will say this is a never ending quest in my opinion. I read creative writing books every single year, uh, usually three to four of them every single year uh, because even though I might know a lot of what I'm reading, I always learn some little new thing that I didn't think about or a new way of thinking. The other cool thing about writing is you also sometimes don't learn things until you're ready. So I've got people that come to my classes that'll come year after year after year to the same exact classes and it always boggles my mind because I'm like, what are you learning? And every time they're like, oh, I learn a million things that I didn't know yesterday. And, even, and it took me a while to realize it's that they weren't ready to hear certain things of the class. And so the first time they took it, they learned this, but this other stuff just didn't impact them at all. They didn't even remember that they heard it. And they come to the exact same class next year after they've grown as, you know, as a writer for a year, and now they're learning the next chunk that they didn't realize they had missed. And then the next time they're learning even a bigger, deeper chunk. Um, because if there's one negative about my classes, and I don't know how to fix this, I'm a fire hose of information. And for those that have come to my classes, I give way too much. And I, I don't know, like, I've, I want to take advantage of this time. You know, I get 45 minutes. I'm like, I'm going to give you as much as I can. Uh, because I used to sit out there. And it, I was always frustrated when I went to writers' conferences because I'd go to panels and I'd be like, oh, OK, there was one thing I learned from that hour that I just spent with you. And I always said, if I ever got up there, I'm going to do it different. And so this is me doing it different. Um, so I am. I know I'm a fire hose. That's, that's all I can be. Uh, because you're a fire hose, I watched the replay of the sessions, but you had a limited time that it was available at the conference. Is that going to be true this year, too? Yeah. Yeah, they're recording them, and I'm pretty sure they're going to be up. Uh, so uh, the mic wasn't on or whatever, but she asked, are the recordings going to be up after the convention? As far as I know, they are. Okay, but um, you, you were only available for a month after. So, yes, I also have online classes and stuff like that, so I don't allow the conventions to have me up for free for too long. Um, that's just me being greedy, I guess, but I got kids to put through college. <laughs> right. Although, the class I did, my show don't tell class, which is probably my most popular class, I did for 2020 Comic-Con, uh, when it was online only, and they promised me it was only going to be up for three months, and um, it's still up. You can still watch it. And I send them an email about every three months saying, hey, <laughs> you should take that down. 
and they haven't yet. So it is still there. I just checked actually last week. I sent it to a client uh, to watch, and it's still there. So if you want to watch my show, don't tell class, which is some of what I did yesterday, but it's it's a little bit more expanded, a little bit more focused on being a showy writer. But that's on YouTube. Just look for my name and Comic Con 2020 or Comic Con at Home or whatever, and you'll find it. Any other questions? Still got like seven minutes. Yes, yes. Um, after meet me after uh, right outside. So my marketing team was kind of mad at me. I was supposed to mention that we're doing a big giveaway stuff, and I'll mention at the beginning of this thing. But Sharon won yesterday, even though I didn't even mention it to anybody. But I'll talk about that in the in the thing. Anyone have any other questions? Anything at all? Not on this topic. Literally on anything. The only thing I won't answer is legal questions because I make stuff up for a living. You do not want to take legal advice from me. There's your joke. Wasn't that good, but it's all I got. What, what, well, I'm famous for writing blood and gore. So I do really like writing action scenes and fight scenes and stuff like that. But I don't know if I have a favorite because I love writing romance scenes. I love writing tear drinking scenes. I love writing I don't know, I, I feel like if I can make me cry, that I've succeeded. Um, so like the, the kids thing that I've, I've got for sale, Snurse, a magic magical fairy tale, I edited this probably about eight times and there wasn't a single time that I didn't get to the end that I wasn't bawling my eyes out. Um, and it's probably one of the reasons why it's one of my favorite things that I've ever written, because it is very, very touching and very, very heartfelt and very, in a very happy kind of way. So I love, I love being able to pull emotions out of readers. Um, there's just something magical about it, about forcing a reader to feel something that, because they read words. Uh, one of my favorite emails actually happened off, the, off of my first book that was ever published. I got an email and the title of the email said, you owe me a personal apology. So of course I opened it immediately. And she said, you know, I was reading this book, it was awesome, I loved it, blah, 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 blah. And then she skipped a couple of lines. She wrote, but. And she skipped a couple of lines. She said, I'm not going to say what it is. I don't want to spoil it. But uh, she said, you did this thing to this character, and it was so devastating to me that I stood up and screamed no at the top of my lungs. And then I remembered I was at Starbucks. <laughs> and I was very embarrassed. <laughs> and you owe me a personal apology. So I wrote her back, and I said, well, first of all, I I apologize. It was never my intent to embarrass you, embarrass you at a public place. And then I skipped a couple of lines, and I wrote, but. And I skipped a couple of lines and I wrote, I wrote a fictitious story about fictitious characters and did something horrible to one of them fictitiously and you were so engrossed in it, you forgot you were in a public place and you made an ass out of yourself. That's awesome. <laughs> like, I don't think I can get a better compliment than that. So, I, I do, I love, it's one of the reasons why I'm so focused on being a showy writer and an, an emotional writer because my, my number one benefit from being a, a writer and a storyteller is to evoke those emotions out of my readers. You know, that's, that's what I strive for. So that's, if I can do that in an action scene, great. If I can do that in a heartfelt, you know, moment, great. If I can do that in a conversation, great. If I can do that wherever, it really doesn't matter to me. My goal is, is the reader going to be moved by this? Either emotionally happy or sad or terrified or whatever. It really doesn't matter to me what emotion it is. Just the thought of forcing a reader to feel something because they're reading words is just magical to me. Time for one more question. I have a quick question. All right. Uh, you told her that uh, you need a writing group. Uh, my writing group is two hours away because I don't have one in my city, and it's not actually, it's more of a Facebook group. I mean, how do you find a reputable writer's group? If there's not one that you really find in your city. So, do you live in a town with at least five or 10,000 people? I live, in a I live in a city with 200,000 people. Okay, then there, I guarantee you there's probably a writer's group in that town. If not, you can make one because there's at least three or four other people in, in a town of 100,000 people that are trying to write. There are more people trying to write today than are trying to read books. So, like, there's a ton of people doing it. Um, hitmeetup.com 
hit Google, um, keep you know, doing it. There's a ton of online groups. Now, I, I don't like online writing groups as much because it's anonymous and sometimes you will get people that say stuff like, you know, I read your thing. Do you ever thought about picking up cans for a living? Like that, that, that doesn't help me no, become a better writer I mean. at all. So you can do online, just make sure you have thick skin from some of those idiots that might say something because you can't slap them in the face. Personal, oh, okay. you know, face to face is always better. Yeah. Um, but start one, go to the library and put up a, a poster. I'm an old D&D or back before, uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons player, back before uh, the internet. And so like to get a group when I moved to a new town, I'd go down to the local hobby stop, post up a note saying, looking for D&D players, call this number. Like, there's a ways to find them. Okay. You know, they're out there. People want to be a part of a writer's group. Um, and it's just the way it is. And, and you really do. You need a writer's group. It's, it's vitally important. Thank you. All right. We've got one minute. Just in case someone straggles in. And then we will start. Because I don't think I'm supposed to start early. Because they're recording it. Who has never taken a class from me before? Who's new to me? Okay, about half of you, that's awesome. I would say the same joke I made yesterday, but half of you already heard that joke, so, you know. It's a bad thing about repeat performances. Am I good to go, or? I can't. <laughs> All right. All right, so welcome. Um, my name is Maxwell Alexander Drake. If you guys didn't Google me, I am an award-winning novelist. I was the lead fiction writer for a massive game from Sony. I'm getting ready to write another video game uh, starting in January. I've written for, I've done musicals and stage plays and comic books and other types of tabletop gaming and TV and movies and all sorts of things. Um, this class is, a, is an interesting class. And I'm doing kind of a hybrid of it because it's normally a two-part class and I kind of combined it up into this one. Um, it originally started as a fight scene class because I was famous for writing fight scenes. But I quickly learned that it's more than that. So in my mind, there's three types of writing, three aspects of writing that you have to master to really become a good prose writer, to be an all-around good prose writer. And they're very, very different. The first is narration, writing narration. We talked about that a little bit yesterday about making it personal and so on and so forth. But when we're gonna describe something, there are rules and tricks and things that we can do to make it more dynamic. So if we're describing this room with me up here and so on and so forth, we're gonna do things to make that engaging and describe it. And that's different from the other two ways. The second way is dialogue, which I'm giving a class on dialogue tomorrow. Dialogue is completely unique, and I think it's the hardest thing to write in the entire world because it is not your characters talking to each other. It can't be your characters talking to each other, and if you wanna know the answer to that question, show up tomorrow, um, because I don't have time to go into it today. But the third is motion. How do we convey motion with words? We can't describe a girl riding a bicycle through a park the same way we describe this room. It doesn't work. We have to think different, we have to write different, we have to change how we put the words on paper and how we formulate things. And so that's really kind of what this one is about. Um, I skipped a lot of the theoretical stuff, which was, there's just no time for it. Like I said, this is normally a two hour class. And we're gonna get into more of the practical stuff and some grammar stuff and stuff like that. Before we start, I always do my little commercial. If you like the way I teach, there's several ways to get more of me. Uh, first, you can get the books. I will have copies of these outside after class. Uh, they're 25 on Amazon, but if you get them for me, you get them signed and you get them for 20. Uh, this one's actually required reading in several divisions of Disney. Uh, this is all theoretical. It's about how to be a better storyteller. It's about theme and structure and you know, ways to, and it doesn't matter what medium you write in, games, novels, short stories, movies, this will make you a better storyteller. This is the one I taught out mostly yesterday and some of today's is in here as well. This is better writing through stronger narrative. It's all about how to think about prose writing, but it's specific for prose. And then last year I was diagnosed with cancer. I went through cancer treatment. I'm on the other side now. Actually, it was uh, the weekend before, the Friday before this convention last year is when I got diagnosed with cancer and then I did this convention and now I'm back a year later. Um, if, thank you. If somebody wants to see a little bit of fiction from me, this is the only thing I could do. It's actually a screenplay that I wrote 
several years ago. It's won numerous awards uh, all over the world. Uh, it's actually sold twice. It was almost greenlit, but COVID killed it. Um, I can tell you the story later. But it's a wonderful story. Uh, it is a children's story, but there's not a single adult that has read it that hasn't loved it. So if you like stuff like Finding Nemo or Monsters, Inc., it's in that vein. So I do have only have three copies with me, so if somebody wants to get some of that, uh, it's also available on Amazon and all that. You can also go to drakeu.com. There's not a lot of classes up there now because, you know, cancer, but there is a big package that has about 10 hours of lessons. I think it's like 42 lessons. It's normally 260 bucks, but with the code, 20 books, 22, and that is a lowercase books. It is case sensitive. You can get 50% off of that. That code is only gonna be good for a couple months. I'm, I am gonna let it go a little bit after the class, but if you wanna take advantage of that, do that. I have a podcast, Releasing Your Inner Dragon, that's available everywhere, that podcasts are available. There's probably 50 or 60 hours worth of it now that's up there. Uh, there's also a YouTube uh, channel with it if you wanna watch us while we're actually doing the podcast. It's me and a, a Finnish author named Marie. We met a few years ago and just really clicked, and so we started doing this podcast together. Um, I'm also doing a monthly Zoom Q&A. It is open. You've got to sign up for it at starvingwriterstudio.com forward slash Zoom. And the first Tuesday of every month for two to three hours, I'm just answering questions. I just pop up on Zoom, and you know, people throw questions at me, and I answer them. You can find that on my YouTube channel, the Drake U YouTube channel. There's only one video up there, which was this month's Q&A, because I just started it. And then I am working on um, a question of the day that will also go on that YouTube channel. So if you, you know, want to get some YouTube stuff, go find the Drake U YouTube channel and subscribe to it. I've got about half of them recorded right now. I got to get, I want to get about 30 to 40 in the can before I start actually releasing them so that I can drop one a day and if I miss a week or whatever, it won't kill me. Um, but I do need questions. So if you do end up coming up with questions later on that you think would be really good to have answered, just on YouTube or whatever, send it to questions at drakeu.com. That's questions with an S, drakeu.com. I would appreciate it, and I'll answer them. All right. Like I said, my marketing team was really mad at me that I didn't mention this. Yesterday, we are doing a bunch of free stuff. Um, yesterday, we gave away a free book. Today, we're actually giving away uh, 10 people will get a Zoom with me. Now, it says for one hour. The last one I did was for Comic-Con. I think we were on it for like three hours. Uh, maybe four hours, I just went through and it was just one-on-one -on -one time with these people and we, whatever questions they had and, and we went through some of their writing, some of, them, some of my writing. It was kind of like an in-depth um, writer's group meeting almost, but it wasn't organized like a writer's group meeting. But if you would like to um, uh, enter for that, it's at drakeu.com forward slash giveaway. You can enter that. And then tomorrow we're giving away the grand prize, which is a, um, not only is it the big course that's for sale for 260, but you also get a one-on-one -on -one consult with me. Just me and you and your writing and you know, at least three hours of time to delve into your writing and have me show you some things that might improve your work. So drakeu.com forward slash giveaway today and tomorrow, and then those are done. All right, I start off all of my class with a quote. This one's from Winston Churchill. Men will forgive a man anything except bad prose. And I mean, that speaks for itself. I just love this quote. It wasn't really a writer, but that's one of his quotes. This class, like I said, is very weird. It's a different class than I normally do. Normally, I go through thinking points, and I, I talk about the thinking point. I give examples on the thinking point. We discuss the thinking point, and then I move to the next one. This one is different. I'm actually going to go through the thinking points very, very fast. And I'm not going to really discuss much about any of them. I'm going to explain them a little bit. But then I'm going to read you something from a published work of mine. Now. Every time I give this class, I always say I'm gonna rewrite this stuff because it was something that was published like 10, 12 years ago. And if you've ever read anything of yours that you wrote 10, 12 years ago, you know it sucks. So I always cringe reading this, but it, it fits this class so well that I just, every time I say I'm gonna do it, I, I know I'm not gonna actually do it, I'm too lazy. So just stick with me for now. We're gonna go through a bunch of different things. And then when we get into my writing, I'll be able to show you how I implemented those things, you know, on a page by page, scene by scene basis as we go through a fight scene, basically. So. Thinking point one is the speed of time. When it comes to the actual action that you're writing, there are two time rates that you need to think about because you can't write an action scene in real time. You know, in a movie, you can throw up a scene and the, the audience immediately gets it. But in prose, you get one word that leads to a second word, that leads to a third word that hopefully forms a coherent sentence that will hopefully be joined with a couple other coherent sentences that form a coherent paragraph that will eventually create a scene. That's what you get. So you can't throw everything up all at one time. So when you're thinking about action, you really can only do one of two things. You can either slow down time or you can speed up time. 
And it really depends on what you're trying to do. When you slow down time, what you're doing is you're forcing the reader to focus on the action itself. So if you're writing an actual fight scene and you're slowing down time, it's because, Mr. Reader, Mrs. Reader, I want you to watch the actual fight. Every move, every motion, every everything. When you speed up time, you're focusing on something else. You have some other reason for doing it, and the, the fight kind of becomes background noise at that point. And you're going to flow through these two time rates. You know, even in one paragraph, you might have you might speed up time and then slow down time in the exact same paragraph. You might do it paragraph to paragraph. You might do it, you know, a couple paragraphs in one and a couple paragraphs in another. And you'll see that when we get into the uh, examples that I have. But it's, that's it. It's really simple. You can't write in real time, so you'd have to write, slow it down, or you have to speed it up. Make sense? All right. Thing in point two is you can't lose your reader. You must always set your scene. And in a fight scene, it's even more important, or an action scene, it's even more important. So regardless of whether you're writing blow for blow or loosey-goosey, the reader has to know where they are at all times. And when things are moving really fast, and things are moving really fast when you slow down time, and I know that sounds like a paradox, but it's not. When you slow down time, what really is happening is things are moving very, very fast for the reader. They're, they're seeing all this action that's going on. You must make sure they know where they're at, at all times because nothing ruins an action scene more than the person not knowing anything. So like, I describe this room and I, you know, I get in a fight with somebody and, and you know, there's tables and there's chairs and then all of a sudden they throw me into the bushes. And you're like, wait, we're in a conference hall. No, we went outside and then we went out to doors and then we're now in the parking lot, but I forgot to set that for you. And so now this bush comes out of nowhere and you're lost and you stop reading and that's terrible. So we're constantly, you know, normally in a scene, you set the scene at the very beginning, and then you can kind of just use it and refer to it and, and make sure that you keep the render grounded in it. But in an action scene, things are moving too fast. You have to make sure that you're constantly thinking about setting that scene. So one of the problems with writing a novel is, whether you realize this or not, you're writing two novels at the same time. You're writing one in your head, and you're writing one on paper. You do not realize that you're doing this. You only see one novel. But when you give the paper novel to people to read, you can't give them the brain novel. Which is why when you're in a writer's group, one of my rules as a writer's group is you can't explain. If you're being critiqued, you can't explain. Because it means that you didn't put it on paper. It's in your head book and not on the paper book. So one of our rules is if you're like, well, what you don't understand is, yeah, shut up. Just make a note, I screwed up and need to explain better, and go away, you're done. I don't need you to explain what you meant to write, I need you to write what you meant to write. So you have to set that scene at all times. Thing point three is dialogue. Dialogue really is at home everywhere. Um, don't shy away from dialogue in an action scene, if it fits. You know, if you're not writing a 1980s action hero movie with a bunch of piffy one-liners, then you probably wanna stay away from piffy one-liners. So it depends on the character, depends on the situation, depends on whatever. I'm just saying don't shy away from it if it feels like the characters would normally do something like that. We talked about this yesterday, strong verbs. But here's the thing about action scenes. And you're gonna see in a second, we're gonna start shortening. One of the tricks that we're gonna use is we're gonna shorten our sentences. Because of this, verbs become even more important. I said yesterday that verbs are the most important word of every single sentence, and they are, but in an action scene, it's doubly so. You really have to pay attention to your verbs. You really have to make sure that they are the exact perfect verb that you want to convey. Because we do write in a language that is stolen from every other language on the planet, which is why there's 30 words that mean the same thing, but they evoke different emotions. They, they evoke different images and so on and so forth. So make sure you pay attention to your verbs. They are vitally important when it comes to action scenes. Really, they're vitally important everywhere, but action scenes are, are definitely where they matter the most. When you write an action scene, you, you have to write in active voice. We talked about this yesterday. You should always write an active voice, unless there's a reason not to write an active voice, but when you're in action, passive voice kills it. It absolutely does. I don't remember if I left it in here. I did leave it in, so we'll go over. So those that were here yesterday, you're just going to go through the same thing again. But this is a very important thing to understand. Um, I'll skip my joke about hating academia because this is a long class. So let's just diagram a really simple sentence, same sentence we did yesterday. I'm not that creative. So the dog bit the boy. 
What's the subject? The dog. What's the action? Bit. So the dog, which is the subject, is doing the action. It is active voice. If we flip it around and the boy was bitten by the dog, what's the subject? What's the action? So the boy is the subject, was bitten is the action, but the boy isn't doing anything. He's passive. First of all, you should never write in passive voice. Right? You just shouldn't in anything, unless there's reasons for it, like I discussed yesterday. Sometimes I want to write a complete sentence, but I don't want to give the um, direct object to the reader. So to get really grammarly, um, the dog is the subject, bit is the action, and the boy is the direct object, or the other way, the boy is the subject, was bitten is the action, and then the dog is the direct object. Sometimes I don't want to give the object that is doing the action, but I still want to write a complete sentence. So if I wrote the boy was bitten, that's a complete sentence, it gives the, the audience the information that I want to give them, and it withholds the information that I don't want to give them. So in other words, I don't want the reader to know who bit the dog, it, or bit the boy. It could have been a dog, it could have been a spider, it could have been his sister, I don't know, I don't care, you're not gonna find out until later because I don't, I'm not gonna give you that information now. But in action, action is active. We don't want to write in passive voice ever. You want to make sure that you're staying with that because the dog bit the boy is so much stronger and more compelling and more interesting, which is why you should do it everywhere as well. But in action, it's vitally so. So some of this is a little redundant, you're just trying to beef it up when you get into the action side of it. So as I said, thing point six, shorter sentences will read faster and thus feel faster to the reader. So another trick to writing action is to shorten your sentence length. This will cause the reader to read faster, thus giving the illusion of speed in action. Commas do work well for this purpose, just don't overuse them. That's one thing that I will say about this piece that we're about to read. I used to read, I still overuse commas because I still love them, but Back then, I really overused them, so you'll see a lot of them in this piece that we're about to read. Um, but it does work. Thing point seven, for every action, there's a reaction. If you are slowing down time and going blow by blow, keep in mind that for the most part, you want to keep the order of your sentences in a very strict action versus reaction way. This will help the reader visualize the action as it's happening, letting them become immersed in it. The worst thing we want uh, the worst thing to have happen during an action scene is for the reader to try to figure stuff out. Now, I don't mean try to figure stuff out like who done it or whatever. I mean like what is going on. I don't see what you think you're showing me. So when you start mixing up the order of actions, you can throw the reader out. So as an example, John staggered back after Jill punched him in the face. Now, this is a very short, truncated sentence as far as you know, the time delay between there. So you're not going to get the impact if it was longer, but it's still the same thing. John staggered back, wait, why did John stagger? I don't, wait, I'm long. Oh, Jill punched him in the face. We're in an action scene. We want it to go really smoothly and really fast for the reader. We don't want their mind wondering, even for a split second, why is John staggering back? Now, sometimes it's advantageous, usually before it starts. So let's say John and Jill are arguing over something and they're in the office and so no one should ever punch anyone in this environment. But we know that Jill's gonna punch John. And so yeah, I might start the fight with this line where it's, but I would even go further than that if I really wanted to hide it. You know, John staggered back, pain lacing through his jaw. He looked around in be bewilderment, you know, maybe even thinks to himself, what the hell just happened? And then he's, you know, his eyes clear and he sees Jill with a fist balled up and he's like, did you just punch me? Like, I'm gonna let that, that confusion that the narrator is feeling bleed into the reader. The reader's gonna be like, wait, what just happened? I don't understand, oh crap. You know, cause that's that punch to the reader. So that's what I mean by that. But now that the fight has started and she's turned into Black Widow, it's gonna be just a fight. And now it's just gonna be action, reaction, action, reaction, action, reaction, 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 because I'm gonna let it flow. We don't need to hide anything at that point. So Jill punched John in the face, causing him to stagger back. Again, crappy sentence, just an example. But it, the reader can read through it very quickly and see the image as it's happening, and it doesn't slow them down. So you want to make sure you're staying in an action, reaction, action, reaction, action, reaction as you're going through your fights or actions. Thing point eight, let the outcome motivate the scene. So as I preached in the other class, I should have probably edited some of these slides too, but I'm too lazy again. Um, in the, in the first part of this, we talk a lot about motivation and motivation for scenes, motivation for characters, and so on and so forth. That's really where everything needs to come from 
for the uh, scene itself. You gotta understand what your characters want to accomplish. Um, in another class I talk about talking to all your characters, even your tertiary characters. So let's say we're gonna have a fight scene where the hero's gonna come through the door and there's three unnamed guards that are working for the evil wizard. Now, I don't know who these guards are. I don't care anything about these guards. I don't know any of their backstory. They're literally gonna die. That's what they're here for. I'm gonna put them here and they're gonna die. But before they die, they're the heroes of their own story. So I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna say, all right, guard number one, I'm gonna do it like the, the dating game. Guard number one. So if the hero was to break into this room, what, what do you want to have happen? And he's going to go, you know what I want? I want to, I want to look really good for my boss because I want a promotion. And, so, and, and besides, the stuff that I've been hearing about this hero is just, there's no way it's true. I'm way better than, than this person is. I'm going to kick their butt. Okay. Guard number two. Well, you know, I mean, let's take it easy here. I mean, I, I do the job for the evil wizard. He pays well. But I took the job because it has really good benefits. And I got a wife and kid. And I'll do my job. I'm, I'm, I'm an honorable guy. But I don't want to die. All right, so if he is as badass as what they say, I'll do my job to a point, and then, you know, maybe, you know, I might not exactly, as long as I can get out here alive, I'll be happy with that. And I'm like, okay, what about you, guard number three? Um, yeah, I, I've never been in a fight before. Um, I took this job because my cousin got me this job, and I mean, the, the, the boss's name is Evil Wizard, and that kind of feels weird to me. So, like, um, I don't know. I don't know what I'll do. Well, just having that simple conversation, guess what? Now all three of them are going to fight different. They're not just going to be three unknown, nameless guys, because I'm sorry, they're all going to die. It's just the way it is. Even the guy that's married, he's going to die. It's the way it happens. A lot of death in what I do. Um, I always love it when I meet a mystery writer because they're all proud of their one dead body in their book. And I'm like, yeah, I've committed genocide in a paragraph. Like, <laughs> you're so cute with your one little kill. Um, but that's epic fantasy. So. Spend time learning everyone's motivation in an action scene because it will make them feel unique. You'll allow them to actually act individually instead of as a mindless idiot. Sort of like, and I love what, uh, what they did in uh, Austin Powers with the henchmen and how they showed if you really actually, you know, if they really were the way they are written in this stuff, how stupid they would be. Um, so don't do that. Learn the motivation of every single character so that you can actually have them kind of act the way that they would do. And it makes the story more interesting. Think of point nine, don't skimp on details, like this slide. Um, the most, for the most dramatic impact, give as much detail as you can, but you can't slow down the action. That's the thing. You're always setting the scene, you're always doing details, but you're doing it in organic ways that don't slow the action down. So as an example, I cut the example um, because I knew I was gonna have not a lot of time in this class. Um, so if somebody knocks a tooth out in a line, like you can do that really quickly. And it shows the brutality of the punch and so on and so forth. That's what the example was. I just cut it out because I knew I wasn't going to have a lot of time. So thinking point 10, don't info dump. One of the worst things you can do is try to explain things like world building items and plot devices during your action scene. Once you start an action scene, it has to be an action scene. One of my favorite world building moments was in The Princess Bride, where they're in the fire swamp, and he says, she says, what about the R.O.U.S.s? And he says, rodents of the unusual size? I don't think they exist. Boom. And he gets attacked by a giant rodent. That's all the world building we need. Like, it's a rodent of unusual size. And they don't talk about the rat from then on out. But I've seen so many people that would want to then go, and the rodents of the unusual size are actually from the, you know, the Badlands, and they were actually mutated by the, like, well, I'm in a fight. I don't want to know about their backstory. So it's sort of like Drake swung his sword at the Gorlab. Gorlabs are large creatures, or large winged creatures from the pit of the abyss that are mixed between dragons and bad children who don't wash between, behind their ears. The sword cleaved the beast in twain. Like, no, no. We're gonna, it, you can't world build during a fight once it starts. You can't, it just kills it. So what do you do? Well, one of two things. Either A, you, like let's say this scene is real, as horrible it, written as it is. Um, I'm gonna look for a place ahead of time to introduce Gorlabs. Maybe Drake and the boys are around a campfire the night before and that campfire scene has to happen because there's a piece of information, dialogue, whatever that has to happen. But since it already exists, maybe Drake is like, hey, aren't these the lands of the Gorlabs? And somebody else is like, Gorlabs, you actually think there's something that's a mix between dragon and bad children? Come on, don't be stupid. Or if that 
can't happen, and this is the first time that Gore Labs are introduced. First of all, I can't use the word Gore Lab if he doesn't know what a Gore Lab is. But second of all, I will just use what he looks like. I will just use the beasts because he can see it, and whatever he can see, I can use. And that's it. And he can smell it, and he can taste it, and he can feel it, and he can be afraid of it, and everything else. That's what I'll use during the fight. But I will not use the fact of where he comes from and how he's made and who his parents were and you know, what he did, had for breakfast. and Like, no. We're not putting that in our action scene. Because afterwards, if I just use the description of whatever this thing is, after they kill it, Drake can be like, what the crap was that? And somebody goes, oh, it's a gore lab. Bad children, you know, that thing. All right, so let's get into it. This is from a novella that I wrote. Like I said, it's published about 10 years ago now. So I'm going to die inside as we read this together. Um, it's not that bad, but it is. Now, I'm, I'm starting in like chapter three because I want to start in this fight scene. So there's a couple things that if you're not a fan of the Genesis saga, you do kind of need to know. First of all, Rathen is not human. He's actually um, way stronger and way faster and way better than a normal human being. He's about 2,000 years old. Uh, he's also a really bad person. This, the reason why I wrote this novella was a gift to my fans because I wanted to show something from the villain. It actually happens uh, like 16 years before the actual saga takes place. Um, but he's, sent, he's being sent by a teleportation. Teleportation in this world is not fun. It takes a really long time and you slowly feel yourself being crushed so you get to feel all your bones break and all of that. Normally when a human teleports, they're unconscious for like six to seven hours afterwards because it's so painful. He's not human. But there is a scene before this that, where he's actually talking to his boss and he's like, well, but I mean, as good as I am, there's still gonna be a moment where I'm not gonna know what's going on. And they're like, yeah, whatever. Um, also, he has been to this place where he's going, which is another bad guy location. Uh, it's been about 500 years. And the last time he was there, he was clawed by this demon creature and he still has scars on the side of his neck as a gift. And so you will see those. I use those as a plot device. And when talking about plot devices, plot devices you need to use like a farmer. You need to plant them, you need to tend them, tend them again if you can, tend them again if you can, before you can use them. You can't just have something come out. I call it the 400 foot of rope phenomenon. I'm not even kidding. The worst thing I've ever had come across my desk was this novel, and there was a scene that literally said, and then the hero found himself trapped with no way off on a 400 foot cliff. Luckily, he remembered to bring 400 foot of rope. Rope had never been mentioned before that. I don't even know where you would hide 400 foot of rope. That's a lot of rope. And it, we're not even 380 foot of rope or, or 420 foot of rope, but exactly the height of the cliff that he happened to get. Yeah, you can't do that. You have to tend it, you have to tend it, you have to reap it. Um, and so just think about that when you're, when you're doing your own plot devices. All right, so let's get into this. With a nod to the blonde haired priest, Rathen climbed the steps and took his place at the center of the Kwe Kagana directly beneath the large red crystal. Peering up into the multitude of facets of the large stone, he watched the pulses dance deep within the crystal's reddish interior. Returning his gaze to his closed fist, he reached his free hand back and withdrew his Ritav staff, willing it to lengthen to just over his height. He uncurled his fingers and shards of red light shot out from the small stone. An instant later, pain washed over him in waves, driving him to his knees. He felt the pressure of the sending crushing in upon him, heard the snap of his bones as it compressed him into smaller and smaller balls of flesh. The agony grew incrementally with each passing moment, moments that stretched into an eternity, a never-ending existence of anguish. A quick glance at the battle priest and he saw the horror of what he experienced it reflected in the man's cold blue eyes. And then, as suddenly as it began, it ended. The pain of the sending withdrew. It started with his extremities, cascading through his body, a wave of relief letting him know that he still lived, that his body was whole. One pain lingered. Looking down, Rathen saw the shaft of a spear protruding from his stomach. Following the shaft, he stared into the wide eyes of a black-haired young man. A silvery and yellow tabard hung over his gleaming chainmail shirt. Fear and determination warred within the young man's dark brown eyes. Another man, similarly dressed and carrying his own spear, ran forward. The second man's intent to add his spear to his companions was clear. So, not really a fight yet, but there's a reason why I want to start here. One, to set the scene, obviously. But two, I really want to talk about scene openings for a second. I could have scene broke here. You use a scene break to designate to the reader that we are moving something big. They just, he just teleported about 1,500 miles away from one continent to another. So I could scene break that in that scene, start a new scene, and set it up from there. 
you also would do a scene break if you're doing passage of time or maybe going into a new character's head. But like I said earlier, I like to force my reader to feel the same confusion that my characters are feeling. It makes it more immersive for them. So I chose to not scene break here. I just cut out about 15 seconds of Rathen's life. Oops, sorry. Um, and I just, Rathen doesn't get those 15 seconds, and so I just don't give them to the reader either. He teleports, he loses consciousness, he regains consciousness, and somehow there's a spear stuck in him. That's it. And so that's why I do it. However, I do a couple things to help out. We're the set designer, so why does the battle priest have blonde hair? Well, because then I can give this other guy black hair, and it's, it's a little visual clue that, hey, you're not in Kansas anymore. Same thing of um, one of them having uh, the, the garb that he wears, and so on and so forth. You know, I make the garb different colors as well, just to give a little bit of visual clue to the reader that you're not in Kansas anymore. But also, when you're opening a scene, and this is every scene, not just this scene, there's really only two ways to open a scene. You can start at macro and move micro, or you can start micro and move macro. So uh, most scenes are going to start macro and move micro. You've got to start off with, like, Drake cast his gaze out over the vast jungle canopy. That says nothing, but it says everything. But th that's starting macro. And now I'm going to start moving details. I might describe a flock of colorful birds or some clouds or a waterfall or whatever. I'm going to get closer and closer. And eventually, I'm going to be with Drake on a balcony doing whatever he's doing. With this, I want to start micro. One pain lingered. That's where we start. And then it's like, oh, there's a spear in me. Oh, look, there's a dude at the other end of the spear. Oh, there's another dude behind that dude. And I'm just slowly bringing the room bigger and bigger and bigger. So again, this has nothing to do with the action scene. I just, it's a cool way to look at scene transitions. If you come to my paragraph, uh, de deconstructing paragraph scene, or tomorrow, we're gonna also talk about this kind of the same thing using different examples uh, and different ways to look at it. So, continuing on. Break spear, dodge, kick face. Bring his left arm down, and snapping the shaft that impaled him, Rathen spun sideways, narrowly avoiding the second man's spear thrust. His right leg darted out, catching the first man below the chin. The man crashed to his back, still clutching the broken staff of his weapon. Feet pounding the ground behind Rathen. Feet pounded the ground behind Rathen. And through the haze still clogging his mind, he realized two more guards were joining the melee. Spinning, his staff whirling so fast it flashed in blurry streaks, he batted away thrust after thrust from the three men. He paid them scant attention, however. He needed time to clear his head and regain his bearings. The memories of his last time in this room echoed in his head, and the scars on the side of his neck began to throb. The room had not changed by hair since his last visit. He fought in a space roughly twice, his size, twice the size of his training chamber back in Komar. Only one door led off from the room. He could not see what lay past the three men in front of him, jabbing away with their spears. If the room held a purpose other than to house the Kwekagana's receiving platform, he could not discern it. Swinging his staff in a wide arc, Rathan forced the three guards back. The fourth guard, the one he had kicked, regained his footing and drew a thick, curved blade. All right, so let's talk about time. I start by slowing down time, because I want you to get into the fight. So bring his left arm down, he snaps it, kicks, blah, 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 blah. Same thing at the, at the bottom, we're going to slow down time again. But in the middle, I speed up time. The fight becomes a background noise. Why do I do that? Because I need to set the scene. I haven't shown you anything. You know, I showed you a spear in his gut, but I haven't shown you the room. Now, I do cheat. I love to cheat when I'm doing fight scenes. In the opening chapter of this, it opens with Rathen in his training chamber. So I've already explained the size of that in pretty good detail. So that was only, you know, 2,000, 3,000 words ago. So instead of describing the same thing here, I'm going to cheat and just go, hey, reader, remember that training room that I described in detail? Yeah, it's about twice that big. Let's just go with that. Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter exactly how many feet it is by how many feet it is. That's just going to slow me down. And so I set the scene really quickly. Also remember, we're the set designers. This could be a room that held anything. There could be dragon skulls on the, on the walls. There could be dancing naked babies in the corners. Who knows? But all of that would have to be described. So I don't want it. It's gonna, I know that the fight is going to start immediately when he teleports in this room. Why would I put anything down here? Also, you guys don't know this, but I know this room doesn't... This room is at the bottom of a palace, and no one has ever used it in 500 years. So it's the home of the immortal emperor, and his guard captain is told, you must have four guards in this empty room in the basement at all times, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. No one's ever used it. Not in my lifetime, not in my dad's lifetime, not in my grandfather's lifetime. But I got to put four guards down there, like because the boss says so. 
Do you put your four best guards down there when no one has ever used an empty room in the basement of a palace? Probably not, because you, the other thing that you don't know that I probably should have said earlier is no one in the world knows that teleporting exists except for a very few people. So like when the guard was actually watching him teleport, he had never seen that before in his entire, he didn't, had no idea that people could teleport. So all he saw was a dude being crushed out of existence. That's, and then he was dead, he was gone. That's literally all that guard got. Um, so that's time. We're gonna slow down time to show the fight. We're gonna speed up time because we have to do something else. And in this case, I'm setting the scene. We are setting the scene. I'm showing you where things are happening. But also notice, while I'm showing you the scene, I make sure that you don't forget that there's a fight going on. So I start it with spinning his staff, but in the middle, I say, he could not see what lay past the three men in front of him jabbing away with their spears. Just to say, reader, remember, I'm showing you this room, but he's still literally fighting for his life. He just is so badass that he doesn't care about these three guys, and he's gonna take a moment to clear his brain. So I'm still making sure the reader gets to feel the fight going on in the background while I'm doing something else, because I don't want to lose my reader at, at all. All right. Athan placed his hands thumb outward on the center of Zatov's staff and snapped it in twain. A loud ping echoed through the room, causing one of the guards to wince. Rathen then willed the two pieces to flatten and lengthen into blades. Crouching, he let his left foot slide forward and held one rune-covered blade in front of him. The other sword hovered over his head like the poisonous tail of a Ceriza. Grinning at, the four panting men, or, grinning at the four men panting hard before him, he flexed his neck until it popped, relieving some of the tension from it. My turn. Faint right, kill man on left. Lunging to his right, he spun left. The guard to his left thrust his spear at Rathen's seemingly unprotected back. Rathen cleaved the shaft of the man's spear with his first sword. His second blade followed in a wider arc, catching the guard just below the chin. The weapon sliced his neck half through and sent a spray of bright red blood arcing across the far wall. Rathen continued to spin, dropping low to the floor. His first blade slipped effortlessly through the thick leather boots, a boot of another guard, severing the man's foot just above his ankle. The man stumbled forward on the bloody stump and screamed. The second Ratab blade, piercing his vocal cord, silenced him. It did not stop until it jutted out the back of the man's skull. Withdrawing the blade, Rathen rolled forward past the half-hearted jab from the last spearman. The metal tip of his spear tinged off the stone floor as Rathen rose between the guard's arms. The man dropped his spear and made a move to grapple before he realized his arms had been sliced from his body. His head followed the severed arms before he could give voice to his pain. So, a lot going on here. First of all, we've got some dialogue. Not much, but a little bit. Also, don't write onomatopoeias in prose. Don't write bam and biff and, you know, the door slammed, bang. That, that's really amateurish. However, there's a lot of verbs that also evoke sounds, like ping and ting and stuff like that. So you can use verbs that have an onomatopoeia kind of feel to them. Um, you can also think about how you construct sentences. So for those that have not read this saga, this question is for you. The other sword hovered over his head like the poisonous tail of a Ceriza. What do you think a Ceriza is? Yeah. There's no scorpions in this world. And in the novels, you've already met a Ceriza. They're basically dog-sized scorpions. They're rather terrifying. Um, but because of the way I ex wrote the sentence itself, you don't need to have read this series to know what that is. So think about that too. I do a lot of that. Like there's this, uh, there's a main church in this main uh, city. And he, when he walks by it, he, he looks up at the Palentium with its massive marble uh, pillars and frescas of the gods adorning the top. What architecture style do you think that building is in? But Palentium is not a real world. But it sounds it. And that's it. You know, you throw in marble and you throw some Romanesque or, or Greek-esque sounding name and bam, use the reader's imagination to your benefit so that you can paint pictures better. So I do stuff like that where I do try and make sure that the reader's bringing something in. And if they don't get it, it doesn't lose anything. You can look at the cover of the book. He's got the sword over his head. Like, whatever. All right. A lot of verbs, a lot of active voice. So snapped, hovered, spun, cleaved, dropping, stumbled. You know, these are all verbs that evoke exactly what I want them to evoke. Notice there are two 
ly adverbs in this. Uh, if you came to my class yesterday, I say don't use adverbs at all, but I told you I use adverbs. Because um, you're always going to use them some. And the reason why they're there is because they're correct. Adverbs are always crappy, lazy writing. And you can always do better if you rewrite them as a show. But if I show that his back is seemingly unprotected, then I'm going to add two or three sentences in the middle of a fight scene. I don't want to do that. I'd rather just use an L adverb. Same thing with the effortlessly through the thick leather boot. If I show that, I'm going to add a sentence of description of what it looks like for a sword to effortlessly slide through a boot and bone. I don't want to do that. I'm just going to use effortlessly. It's not, a, it's not that important to the story. I just want to show that these blades are magical and that they're doing way more damage than what you could normally have. So adverbs are fine. Um, look at the sentence length. We've got short sentences, we've got longer sentences, we've got compound sentences, we've got all sorts of things going on in here. You want to, if you come to my uh, paragraph breakdown uh, class, I will be going through sentence structures and, and varying sentences and everything like that. Everything's in an action reaction once the, la once the fight gets started. It's this, then that, then this, then that, then this, then that, then this, then that, then this, then that. So that you don't have to think about it as you're going through the fight. Now, how much time do I have left? Yeah. Now, like I said yesterday, it's never about following all the rules. So I did something in here. I'm only going to give you a minute to find it. I did something here. If anybody's ever followed me, there's one thing that I hate more than anything else in prose, and almost everybody does, and they do it terribly. I even mentioned it yesterday. I said it's something you cannot do ever in prose, and I did it in this paragraph. Anybody tell me some horrible grammar mistake that I made in this paragraph? Huh? What? Go. I head hopped. <laughs> I head hop all the time. Even though I said you cannot head hop. And there's no POV that allows for head hopping. Why? Because it's cool to have your arms sliced up and not realize that you had your arms sliced up. Like, it's just cool. But no one is going to read that and go, oh, God, this guy's head hopping. I'm done. I'm out. I'm never going to read this guy again. If you understand the rule to the nth degree, you can break them. And no one will notice. Quickly. Sure, but I actually used the, the words before he realized his arms. He, there's no way Rathen could know that. He could, he could assume that. It is. It is. But again, that's a part of the cheating. Part of the cheating is, is that I do technically head hop, but it's so little and slight that nobody's going to stop reading and throw the book away at this point. So that's my point here is, hundred percent, hundred percent. And that's why, as long as you're doing it on purpose, because you've thought about it. Most people head hop because they're not even thinking about it. They have no idea what they're doing. And then I notice it and I put your book down because it's bad. If you're doing it on purpose because you know what you're doing, you're going to get away with it way more than not. Quickly. No, this was published like 12 years ago. Oh, no. No, there's a, if, if afterwards, if you want to talk to me about all the things that I would not do differently. I mean, like one of the big things is, is now I give all of my tertiary characters at least three descriptors. So in this one, it's just the man, the man, the first man, the second man, the third man. The, like, ugh. Reading that was just painful to me. Um, I mean, it works, and so many people write that way and whatever, but, but yeah, no. All right, let's finish this up. The last guard glanced around in open horror. Spinning on his heel, he made a mad dash for the open archway leading from his chamber, or from the chamber. As the first word of alarm left his lips, the throwing dagger's point bit into the back of his neck. Its hilt came to rest at the base of his skull. The guard continued forward for several steps until his legs crumpled, dumping him onto the floor. The man, before the man's body came to a complete stop, Rathen ran past, retrieving his dagger as he moved. He held both her top blades in his left hand as he made for the door, willing them to meld into one sword. Another thing that I don't do is stop writing lefts and rights. Like, that sentence would read so much better if he held both Rattab blades in one hand as he made, like, who cares what hand it's in? So there's a lot of lefts and a lot of rights and that I used to do all the time, and it's just, for the most, sometimes you definitely need to specify which, but mo like that, there's no reason I should have done that. 
Um, like I said, there's a lot in here that makes me cringe. But anyway, so we're letting the outcome dictate the scene. This fourth guard, well, you already know that these guards aren't the brightest tools in the shed because it's a room that no one has ever used in 500 years, and yet you have to put guards down there. So literally, if you pay attention, even though there was a lot going on, Rathen literally said, my turn, and then he did one spin and killed three of the guy's friends. The guy, and plus he teleported in the middle of them, which that doesn't happen either. So the guy's already freaked out, which is why he didn't stab him in the neck, and he stabbed him in the side, and I don't go into that in the story, but this is my reasoning for why he didn't just kill Rathen straight out. Um, so understanding what the guards are and what their motivation is and what they're feeling and allowing them to kind of decide, oh crap, I'm gonna run, because fight or flight, that's what people feel when they're in these situations. Once you just saw this guy pop out of nowhere and kill three of your friends with one move, you're probably gonna run. I would run, um, and so that's what I had this guy do. Again, it's, it's kind of thinking about how each character will have their own motivation, um, and so on and so forth. And we also have a lot of details in here. We have avoided info dumps. I don't explain anything as we're going other than what we're seeing. There's, there's two chapters before this, so you get a ton of world building and stuff that's happening. There's stuff that happens after this, um, and so on and so forth. So. Um, Hopefully, you guys got everything out of this. I will be outside for as long as you guys want me to. I feel much better today than I did yesterday, so I'm gonna hang out for a little while. I'm here all day tomorrow, too. I've got a class in the morning, a class at night, but everything in between, I just sit out there, and whoever wants to talk to me, you've got like six hours that you can just literally sit with me the whole time if you want to. Weird way to spend a conference, but if you want to, I'm gonna be there. Um, remember, if you wanna join the giveaway, it's drakeu.com forward slash giveaway. Uh, my Zoom for my monthly Zoom is starvingwriterstudio.com forward slash Zoom. And then the 50% off coupon is 20 books 22 and that's for the big package. There's only one other class on there. I've got a bunch of classes that are in the process of being, uh, I've recorded them and now they're being um, video edited and all of that. So there will be more classes coming up now that I've got my beard back after my cancer treatment. I wasn't gonna record anything without this. I looked like a skeleton. Um, but uh, the big one is the one that you get 50% off on. Because if, if you do this code on the small one, it doesn't actually do 50% off, it actually does a price. So you get the 17.99 package for 130 bucks. Which you can do if you want to. Just saying, it's kind of silly. Um, so that's it. Hopefully you guys learned a thing or two. And again, if you have questions about action scenes or anything that went over or want me to go into deal, more detail, I'll be out there for a little while. Thank you.